Hey y'all, hey, it's JJ Conway. Welcome to Building Wealth Together, where our goal is to help you walk in abundance and leave a legacy. It's Wealth Building Wednesday, where we answer your money questions with style and grace. To ask your question, go to buildingwealthtogether.com and click Ask JJ, or leave a voicemail at one 4 ask jjc Normally, we'd answer questions, but today we've got some wealth building teaching instead. The number one thing I've been working with my clients on during this time of COVID has been feeling comfortable charging what you're worth. And so that wasn't just a COVID problem, but COVID made it worse. Today, in our introductory lesson, you are going to learn three things that you absolutely need to feel comfortable charging what you're worth. So if there's any of you out there today that don't recognize my voice, I'm JJ Conway, and I'm delighted to be here with you today. It is great to be in this program, which I wrote with the help with my mentors, Paul Martinelli and Roddy Galbraith, as well as renowned plastic surgeon, Dr. Harold Bafidis. These three men made the content of Dr. Maxwell Maltz's book come to life for me. One of the things that these lessons taught me and a huge part of why I worked with my mentors to bring this content to you is that it really doesn't matter how much you've accomplished. It doesn't matter how many accolades or degrees or letters follow your name. You can accomplish everything and still hate yourself. My goodness, y'all, I was the first African-American to hold the position of physicist in the Air Force. I excelled at that job, and I either chaired or was the Air Force voting member for some of our nation's highest technical committees. After being told back at the academy that I couldn't even declare physics as my major at the Air Force Academy because blacks can't do physics, right? Like, despite all that success, doing it anyway, right, I still felt like a total fraud. Like at any moment, someone was going to figure out that I have sensory processing issues and I didn't think properly. Look, people already could know that. I didn't know they know that, but people already could tell. <laughs> you know, I felt large and in charge when I had my uniform on, mm -hmm. but when I took it off and I had to face myself in the mirror, oh, I felt worthless, y'all. I felt unlovable. I felt useless. I felt like a fraud. And I'm sure some of you out there have probably felt those ways too. This class today is going to help you put those feelings where they belong, in the past. Like many of you, I did lots of things, plenty of things to help me feel better about myself. I mean, I accomplished a lot trying to fill that empty hole. I threw myself into ministry because, you know, everybody says we all have a God-shaped hole in our heart that only he can fill. And that's true. I think that's true. But there's also a longing for acceptance and belonging. And we'll never find it from others unless we first give it to ourselves. One of the many things that I tried was running races and an old Air Force chief told me, <laughs> uh, I'm glad he did this. He'd probably get in trouble for telling people this today, but uh, he told me a big girl like me needed to run races or some other significant physical feat to earn the respect of my Air Force peers. He was right to some extent because running races regularly greatly helped my career. Okay. But it didn't change how I felt inside. I still remember my first 5K. I was so proud of myself for all of about mm, a minute. I mean, after all, I'm in the military, right? All of us should be able to do that. Then I did a 10K. I was satisfied with myself for, again, a hot minute. And then I realized nobody seemed to care. After all, it wasn't a marathon or anything. I then did a series of half marathons, and that still didn't stop the voice that was whispering, you're not enough. After all, that voice insisted, the half is just a cop-out for people who can't hack a full marathon. Then I finally did it, and you see my medal, and you see my, my, my tracker there, the Marine Corps Marathon. Oh, I did it, but I was so slow that the people handing out the military finisher coins were already gone before I crossed the finish line. I missed out on a lot of the freebies, like all the free drinks and gizmos and, and gadgets that they give you and all the shirts and things like that. To add insult to injury, when I went to go get my finisher, my official finisher gear, 
I was too big to fit in any of the women's clothing. And again, that voice twisted in my heart. You're not good enough. You know, like I was saying earlier, somebody can accomplish all sorts of amazing things and still have a very low self-image. Finalist for Ms. Veteran America 2014. Now, by the time I took this stage, I was more at peace with who I am, who I was, okay? I had learned to accept myself for the for the most part, and I was honestly just thrilled to be on that stage. I mean, come on, Lamont Rucker and I'll be sure we're like fighting for my attention. Like, I was totally thrilled, right? I actually did relish this experience, um, and I earned the most money for the Women's Veterans uh, Transitional Home in Alexandria. So this was a very fun time for me personally. But my heart broke, y'all, to discover just how many of the younger women truly hated themselves. So much of their self-worth came from others' value of their looks. And see, Miss Veteran America isn't a true pageant. You don't just win because you're pretty, okay? Some of the fiercest warriors in the world we're in this competition and it's all about advocating for homeless women veterans, which if any of you know some of my stories, I actually was a homeless woman veteran for a little bit, okay? And so, you know, some of these amazing, tough, fierce warriors told me privately how much they hated themselves, thought they were too ugly or too fat. Just find someone to love them for who they are. Anyone else feel that way today? Anyone else wish that people would just accept them as who they are? Anyone else accomplished a lot of amazing things and still have a self-image that's hindering them from achieving their dreams? I know I'm not alone in this. It's my highest selling class. I know I'm not alone in this. I'm not gonna spend as much time on this story as I normally do, okay? But it is the foundation of why this class is so important to me. So let me tell you about this car accident, okay? Um, when my was six months old, he and I were rear-ended. I lost use of my left arm for a while. I praise God for physical therapists because they gave me back the use of my arm. And um, he, he took a little longer to recover. But uh, eight months later, I was rear-ended again and diagnosed with some pretty life-altering cognitive injuries. See, I didn't know it at the time, but I was actually exhibiting the symptoms of a stroke and nobody thought I was really going to recover. I was removed from my job as chief of protocol for four-star general. And not only did I not get promoted to, to full bird colonel like so many had expected, but I got moved into this out of the way unit where I had no duties assigned for four months. In retrospect, I feel like I probably needed that time to heal, you know, but at the time it felt like I'd been put out to pasture. OK, and I had been a member of the John Maxwell team for maybe about six months or so. And I had built a mentoring relationship with Paul Martinelli and Roddy Galbraith that I mentioned at the beginning. And so I kind of went to them whining about how I wasn't able <laughs> to achieve my dreams. Right. Like this car accident, this kid on his phone. They did. He just took away my life. Right. Um, but Paul did not let me use that car accident as an excuse. He reminded me, it's impossible for you to outperform your own self-image, okay? It's impossible for you to outperform your own self-image, whether that self-image comes from something like an accident or whether it comes from something that has been programmed into you from day one. Now, I'm talking about some kid driving too fast in the rain on his cell phone and Paul sitting here talking about the self-image and how it's impossible to outperform your own self-image. Oh, I was hot, y'all. Give me my money back, right? <laughs> and he said, if you want to change. And I'm going to tell y'all, that's why I was in the class, because I needed something to change. My whole life was disappearing before my eyes. Everything that I had worked so hard for was slipping through my fingers. And Paul said, if you want to change, you've got to change. That's what you got to change. You've got to reprogram your self-image. Now, I didn't agree, honestly, but come on. What choice did I have? So over time, following his advice and with my determination combined with the Lord's healing power, 
I have healed so much. For those of you who haven't heard this before, I have healed so much <laughs> that the doctors, that the doctors for the insurance money said on an eval that there's absolutely no way I could have healed this extent unless I'd been faking all along to get insurance money. <laughs> Now, I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I still have faux pas and I still have issues and, and, and I still have memory concerns, but that's okay, right? The, the, I'll get there, right? What I discovered was despite all of the things that weren't going right and all of the lasting effects, neck, back, cognitive, all of that, I discovered that Paul was right. You can't outperform your own self-image. And he's also right that you can change it. And that's why I worked with him to package these lessons and bring them to you. Now, I did tell you we're going to talk about the three things that you need in order to feel comfortable charging what you're worth. And we're going to get to that in just a second. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the mind and body. We now know so much more about the mind and body than we did 60 years ago when Maltz wrote the book. The scientific evidence is confirming everything that he said, and it makes it that much more compelling. So what Dr. Maltz theorized, I think, is just now being borne out in the study of cognitive neuroscience and behavioral psychology and the neurochemistry of the brain. Of the brain. <laughs> the brain. <laughs> Told you all I'm not perfect yet. <laughs> There's been an explosion in these fields over the last five years, okay? And so 60 years ago, Dr. Maltz, who was also a plastic surgeon, hypothesized that it was the self-image or what we now call the ego mind is not changed by the intellect alone, by but by literally experiencing life. So what we see is that change is possible, change is predictable, and change is essential if you want to live a happy, healthy, wealthy life. Isn't that what you wanna do? I know that's what I wanna do. You can't outperform your own self image. This is such a simple concept to understand, but my goodness, it takes everything to understand. I promised you the three things that you need to feel comfortable uh, charging what you're worth. So let's dig into that a little bit. The very first thing you need to know is your purpose. I bet you thought I was going to say you need to know how much everybody else is charging, right? <laughs> That's coming. That's coming. But for now, let's talk about your purpose. What is your purpose? Why are you here? I mean, really, why are you here? There's a quote. I tried to find the author, but Google gave me all these self-help books, so I couldn't find it. There's this quote that says, when you're born, you have life. But when you have purpose, you start living. And it's purpose that makes living significant. What is your purpose? Maybe you don't know. You know, I, I, maybe maybe you were like me. You know, you, 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 it's it's a your purpose is a cliche that you were taught. You know, for years I went around parroting what my ex husband wanted my purpose to be, or what my church said was the right thing to say. You know, the right godly spiritual thing to say that you're not prideful or anything. I I, I didn't even I didn't even know what I liked. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know. I was just drifting along, you know, for the scientists who are little air molecules just bumping around with, with no direction. And, and, and I was just borrowing direction from other people. And so one of the things that we have to do is we have to work to uncover truly what is our purpose? And it's okay to get it wrong. This is not a right or wrong thing, okay? You know, it's okay to get it wrong. It's okay to try out a purpose and realize that's not quite it. You're kind of halfway there, 50% there, 40% there. Or it's also okay to have a purpose. You get it right, but it doesn't resonate with everyone. This isn't a one chance kind of thing, okay? You know, you don't get one shot and you blow it and you're done, right? No, 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 no. You can keep growing and growing and growing. You know, a lot of times we grow into our purpose. Now, we can deliberately find our purpose with a purpose vision goals workshop, and I love doing those, and sometimes it just comes to you. Write down a purpose that if you're taking notes today, just go ahead and just jot something. What comes to the top of your mind, and then pray or meditate on it. Just kind of, you know, try it on. Just try it on and see if that's you. Now, my purpose is equipping God's people. That's what I'm put here to do. 
And that's a very for purpose for a, a financial planning business. Let me tell you, it resonated with absolutely no one. <laughs> <laughs> resonate with me. I sought the Lord in prayer and that's still the purpose that he has for me. And I love it. I love equipping God's people, but in the business world did not work at all. All right. So now, so, so the, all of that spectrum is okay when it comes to your purpose. All right. And what the most important thing isn't whether or not everybody in the world resonates with your purpose. It's whether or not you have one because your purpose is going to do two things for you understanding your purpose and what drives you behind the purpose. This is what pushes you through the discomfort of doing something new. See, um, if you keep doing, if you keep doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting. Okay. And that's what a lot of us are doing. We say we want change, but what do we do? We keep doing the same things over and over and over. And two things we've been doing over and over and over that finding our purpose changes for us. We've been scared to try new things. We've been scared to branch out there in business. Okay. We've been scared to move forward. And then now that's number one. And number two is we've been giving so much of our energy to so many other things that we don't have time or money or energy for our dream. But guess what? Your dream, it wants all of you. Your dream wants all of you. So you got to get clear on your purpose because it will help you filter out what's not in alignment with your dream. And when you filter out what's not in alignment with your dream, now you have more energy, money, and capacity to execute your business, your dream, your calling, your nonprofit with excellence. See, when I have my act together and I've hindered my, international, my, my internal business, I approach the sale differently than when everything is falling apart. And I'm so desperate for your business that I whittle my price down to almost nothing. We have to get clear on our purpose, okay? If you need help getting clear about your purpose, let me know and I'll send you my Purpose Vision Goals Workshop or you can get on the waiting list to uh, for the next time that we do it live, okay? So the next thing that we need to know, the next thing that we need, not necessarily need to know, but then, yeah, we do need to know. The next thing <laughs> that we need to feel comfortable charging what we're worth is we need to know our value. Now, sometimes there's a legit difference between the value of the market and your actual value, right? Okay. So for example, when I started Precious and Pleasant Boutique back in 2002, um, the ladies in my church, they all wore the sequin suits and the hats and the girls dressed with the pageant ruffly dresses with the little ruffly socks and, and, and everybody just dressed that way. Right. But society changed. Our church population changed on me. And even though I was offering these hundred dollar outfits for 30 to $40, now Walmart carried little dresses and suits for $10 and I couldn't compete. I didn't have the desire to pivot that business like other boutiques did. Okay. So there's sometimes a legit market issue. But that's not usually the case. And nine out of 10 of you who watch this, who feel like you wish you could just charge what you're worth, you might be blaming external factors, but it, not, it might not be your offering. Let me tell you a story before I dig into this a little bit. I was at a trade show and one of my favorite vendors was lamenting that no one wanted to buy her hand knit beanies and scarves. And they were nice, but I mean, they were they were the same things you find in the store, right? So trying to be helpful, I kind of tried to be gently and inquiring about the price. And you know me, me trying to be gentle doesn't always work. <laughs> So I, she was like, I put hours and hours into each one of these and I am not lowering my price. I get it. I get it. Right. But I mean, honestly, I'm a mom. They look like the same ones at Walmart for $5. And I know the Walmart ones aren't well made, but I got boys and that beanie is not lasting more than a few weeks in my household. Anyway, before I find it being used for some experiment or being in the tub as a play boat or something crazy like that. Right. The market does not care how much time you put into something. 
Okay, and so this is a big problem for people who craft. You put 50 hours into a garment and the market will only bear $20. And you got to decide if that's worth it, right? You know, if, if you just like to craft, it may be worth it just so you can get those things out of your house and your husband or your wife is all upset at you, right? Uh, but, but you have to decide if it's a business or a hobby, right? So now some of these things really are genuinely, some of these things are genuinely the market. Um, but let me tell you, most of it isn't the market. Most of it isn't the market. Nope. We're going to get to in about 40 seconds why that is. But let me tell you the rest of this knit beanie story, okay? So I leave my friend and I go to the other trade show in town. Same day, same town, same marketing population. We start at one, we go to the next because there's only two, right? There's this lady selling hand knit items for the same price as my friend. And she's got a line wrapped around her booth, like annoying the booth next to her because all these people are coming to her and not them, right? I observe for a little bit. And then after a while, when the crowd dies down, I ask her why she's got so many customers lined up for hand knit items in Louisiana in the summer. She said it's because every single piece she makes was one of a kind using luxury yarns that are limited edition. Her biggest sales or customization. That big crowd that I'd seen were people picking up their custom orders. She set herself apart in the marketplace through customization and luxurious experience. Same product, same day, same town, same heat and humidity, two different results, okay? So sometimes it's the market, but sometimes it's our mechanics and understanding what the market wants. And that's research. You know, that's research that you can use to determine the value of what you're offering, okay? That's not the only part of your value. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. But but that's that's the research part of it, okay? That's looking at your competitors, benchmarking their best practices. And look, you don't need to pay me to do that. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong. You can pay me. Queen of cash flow on Cash App and PayPal. You can pay me. You can pay me. I will gladly take your money. I'm trying to change communities here. I will take your money. But most of you can do that research on your own. Okay. That's but only one part of value, though. Your value, most of it isn't the market. It's you. It's you. I was so hurt on that live call with hundreds of other John Maxwell team members when I gave Paul Martinelli my laundry list of reasons why my business wasn't flourishing. And he was like, nope, it's you. It's you. And he was all casual about it. He's like, that's you. <laughs> he's, from, he's from Pittsburgh, right? He's like, that's you. <laughs> it was me. I was the reason I wasn't succeeding. I had gone to George Mason for a year to get my financial planning certificate. I had been helping people dump debt through nonprofits like Virginia Cooperative Extension and Our Daily Bread for 15 years before I monetized this skill. I knew what I was doing, but I didn't believe in myself. My mentor, Rusty Hodges at the time, my very first business coach, uh, he pushed me to charge something, anything, $5, $10, $20, anything to get past this, everything's free and I'm not worth it mentality, right? So I charged $29 for a free financial tune-up. Y'all, that tune-up was 90 minutes with the client and about three hours of research to prep for it. Minimum wage would have been $32.50, y'all. I didn't get into business to make minimum wage and neither did you. If you don't believe in yourself. No one else will. If you don't value yourself, no one else will. If you don't honor yourself, no one else will. The way you treat yourself sets the standard for others. You are training people how to treat you with every interaction. And what I was training people to treat me as was a fearful, scared, easily manipulated little girl who didn't know 
herself, her value, her worth, who didn't believe in herself, who didn't honor herself, who didn't value herself. And sometimes, y'all, we do it without even realizing because we haven't learned what signals we're sending out. Like, I love to give away stuff. I love to give away stuff because most of my success has been built on things that were freely given to me. And when I find someone like me, I give freely and they bloom with the content and they do what I did for most of my mentors. They send me business just like I send my, my mentors business. So that's a personal weakness, okay? But most people aren't like me. So 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 uh, you know, they don't do that for you. Don't even ask. No, you cannot enroll in self-image class for free. I did activate my Steelers code for today only, but you are not getting in free just because it's my weakness. <laughs> Seriously, though, a lot of us are so fearful. We're so hesitant. We're always wondering if we're doing it right or not. We're not we're, we don't realize that there's no one right way. And a lot of times we actually won't know our value in the marketplace until we put something out there and see how the market responds or doesn't. So those are the three things that you need in order to feel comfortable charging what you're worth. You need to know your purpose. You need to know your value and you need to believe in yourself and the value that you bring to the table. If you've got to go, I understand, but I'm going to give those of you who can stay a little longer some bonus content from the first lesson of our self-image rising class, okay? This class, this class helps you eliminate limiting beliefs. This class will help you redesign your self-image and increase your confidence. It is so powerful, y'all some point, like I was saying earlier, you're going to get it. It's going to click and you're going to get what all this means and you're going to get what it means for you. Okay. I love the example of Fleming with this, right? When he came back from holiday, he had left his Petri dishes unwashed in his lab. He came in two weeks later and looked at one and was like, whoo, and he put it under the microscope. And when he looked through, he saw the mold eating the bacteria and he got what it meant. He got what it meant. Now, how many people could have looked at exactly the same thing and not got the significance of that? When he got the significance of that, and thank goodness he did, because what a difference it's made to have penicillin and antibiotics and all those kinds of things, right? But actually, if you think about it, you're going to get a similar now, I don't know about if it's going to be on that scale. I mean, like maybe you're not going to change the world for 100 years to come with a new drug, but, but you might. You might. I want 1% royalties if you do. <laughs> but for you in your life, I guarantee you, you will have a breakthrough with this program. See, he, he, didn't, he didn't change the world with just that insight, okay? Just getting the implication of that. It took him years to run around and get anyone to really listen to him and take him seriously. And I think, now if my history is correct, I think it was only when the war broke out and people were being shot and the bullets didn't kill them, but the bacterial infections were setting in and that was killing them. Like people started taking an interest and eventually it took off. So he had the insight. And then he had to work to make use of his insight, okay? He had to work before he could get any real change with it. And it's going to be the same for our insight, for your insight. Once you grasp the power of self-image psychology, you're going, to get, you're going to get it in whatever way works for you, speaks to you. And that intellectual insight is yours. It's yours forever. And it'll be like you're oriented in a different direction. But you might be oriented in a different direction, but you still got to move, okay? You, you still got to move forward. Oh, I see clearly now this is the direction I need to go, but I can't sit here and say, oh, that's where I need to go. I need to move. You got to integrate that understanding in order for it to make a difference in your life, in order for it to change your life. I think this is like taking golf lessons. Oh, and we're live. You, you know, you're an Air Force officer, you're playing golf, and you know you really ought to get some help to get a little better, right? Because like golf is part of, of corporate world, is part of the Air Force for sure. And so you get this golf pro, and the golf pro says, all right, show me your swing. 
you swing the golf club and he looks at you and he says, yeah, you're going to need to change the way you're holding the club. Or he says, you're going to need to change the way you lead with your shoulder, right? He gives you all this great advice about what you need to change. And you look at him and you're like, but you don't understand. This is my golf swing. I, I can't tinker with those things. It's just what happens. I, I can't change that. And that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? It's like in the moment, doesn't that make great sense? Like, right? Like, because each of us internalize something, it feels like it's a part of us. You know, habits feel like they're a part of us. It's not something we do. It's just something that's a part of us. It just kind of happens on its own, you know? Like, I don't know why when I hit the ball, it keeps going that way. It just happens. Beliefs are the same way. And when they are integrated, they are a part of us. And so when someone challenges what we believe, we actually feel like they are challenging us. They're not challenging something we've learned. We feel like they're challenging us because it's a part of us, right? So you got to take that, that intellectual understanding, whatever you're getting out of the self-image discussion, and it's got to be emotionally integrated so that it can become a part of you and you can use it going forward. Okay, so your golf pro encourages you to see that you weren't born with that golf swing. You learned and you developed it over time. It's all natural to you, but you learned how to do that. And then as he's explaining that, you're like, huh, yeah, that kind of makes sense, right? You know, I kind of see that in my mind's eye, I get what that means. I understand. I developed that swing. And if I develop the swing, well, then that means I can develop a new one, right? And, 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 and slowly you get it. And at that point of intellectual insight, let me ask you. What does it do for your golf game? Nothing. <laughs> you swing that ball and exactly the same thing happens as happened before when you were, <laughs> when you were swinging it wrong. <laughs> and you know why that is? Because you know it, but you haven't integrated it. It's not intellect alone, y'all. It's experiencing. It's not just positive thinking. It's positive doing. We're going to go through these lessons once a week, and I promise you, it is going to change your life the way that these principles changed mine. Join me today at buildingwealthtogether.com. I'm JJ Conway. Y'all take care and be blessed. Love the podcast? Be sure to like, subscribe, and forward to three friends. You can ask a question or take a life-changing class at buildingwealthtogether.com. Now, go walk in abundance and leave a legacy.